Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Follower Podcast. Uh, if you don't know what the making of is, the idea is that I go through my life and I meet people that I think are just fascinating. And then I ask myself the question, I wonder how those people became who they are. So today on the Follow-Up Podcast, we have a friend of mine, Ariel Katumbela. Welcome to the show. Hi. Everybody, welcome. Welcome people in TV hey. land. Hi. People in TV land. Podcast Hi, land. Hi, Mom. It's a podcast. It's a podcast. I don't know. Podland. 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 Podland pods. peeps. Yeah. So the reason <laughs> that I put, I uh, asked Ariel to come on is because... You think because I'm fascinating? I do. It's, uh, it's awkward now. Did you hear the record? Yeah. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> so uh, about... Three years ago. Mm -hmm. About three years ago, the Lord answered Ariel's prayers and put me in her life. Wow. That's powerful. That's, For patience. That's the thing. About three years ago, <laughs> I, I met Ariel at a YWAM base. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't know what YWAM is, tell us a bit about YWAM. What is YWAM? YWAM is called, <laughs> it's actually Youth with a Mission. Um, Obviously, the acronym for that is YWAM. And basically what that is, it's a um, missional, found, like, missional... Like an organization? Organization, yeah. yeah. It's a missional organization um, that empowers young people um, to do the mission of God, to go into the world, um, to find what their heart beats for and how that fits into the bigger picture of ministry. Um, so what happens is entrance into YWAM is three months of training and just discovering who God is, discovering yourself, um, <clears throat> how you fit into this whole picture of faith. Um, and then it's like the work within and then the, the commission to go. So three months, you pray for a country, you go somewhere, um, and you do outreach, basically. So um, that's the initiating phase into YWAM. And then from there, people begin to find out um, what they feel their heart is for and where they, where they need to go. And so we met at YWAM at a base called the Joseph Project. Mm. Why were you there? Because you, you had done YWAM. <laughs> Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Why were you there at that time when we met? So that's a really funny story, actually. Yes. I had come out of a relationship, and I was broken. So what happened was um, <clears throat> I had been with YWAM previously, and I did all kinds of amazing things. I feel like I sold myself dreams that were not <laughs> dreams that God had promised. So I was just like, okay, I had started traveling. Like, I was this chick who grew up in the hood. So like going to the States and going to, you know, Asia and stuff like that. Um, Next of next, I go to the States, mess around, get into a relationship. <laughs> and um, that didn't end well at the end of. So just before I, I met you at that YWAM base, um, I was called by um, the leaders of that base, um, Young Me and Dylan, who were kind of my mentors through life. And they were like, just come and worship, you need it. <laughs> wow. So I came there, I was sitting across just like miserable, trying to, um, I think, Coming out of my misery a little bit, out of the morbs a bit, but <laughs> the morbs. Uh, the morbs is By the way, thing. the morbs spelled yeah. like this <laughs> is uh, is a phrase that we use in our friendship circle that yeah. comes from the legend, uh, Mr. Mark, Mark Brooks. Brooks. Shout out to you. So thanks, Pastor Mark Brooks. The morbs means maybe I'll put it in Urban Dictionary Do and it. you can go find it. The morbs. the morbs. How would we define the morbs? So it's derived from the word morbid. Morbid. And the morbs is the state of one being morbid without quite being able to climb out. So, but you can expand on that, like the, the morbs. morbs. Powerful, the that's morbs. wonderful. So you were in the morbs? I was in the morbs, okay. but I was kind of coming out of the morbs. So I sat there and I was just like, okay, God, I wanna allow you to define what success is and what, what this looks like. Um, because I already had my ideas of what my ministry journey would be. And then I saw, they invited you to um, play and teach and stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I thought you were from Australia because you had a weird accent. A lot of people have said that. Really? It's unfortunate that now I do this for a living. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm joking. I did think you were from Australia because with YWAM you meet people from all over. Right. So I was just like, then when I heard you speak a little bit more, I was just like, ah, oh, it's just South African. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'm joking. No. But then... Um, your conversation, I mean, your, um, your share about Jesus, um, I remember specifically what you spoke about was about Jesus and um, who he is, what we've understood him to be and what we make him out to be versus the reality of who Jesus is. Um, at that place, I had definitely constructed my own version of Jesus and he had made me aware of it. So I was in a space of trying to move away from that. 
and the week before I'd been journaling about the fact that like Jesus, I don't know who you are. Like I don't I need somebody to I need something to just anchor that. Like give me give me a at least this is who I am and let's work from there. Um so I did feel at that moment something clicked and something shifted and I I feel like I began to see him for, from a different angle and from a, a better perspective. Um, and I think it was more words that I hadn't been able to construct for myself. Mm. Like mm. you gave words to um, mm. what I was looking for, what I was looking to understand that I hadn't mm. heard before. Mm. So yeah. And then we went on a journey for three years, mm. kind of this friendship has been building for three years. And then, uh, so we, we started a community in the inner city together mm -hmm. in Maboneng Precinct. We did, that. did that for a while. You ended up working at the church which that. is where you're working now. At the moment. That's where you, and now you're going on this new adventure. Yes. You're not exactly sure what that looks like just no. yet. Okay. No. But, you're, but you're moving out into something new uh, as you follow Jesus, yes. right? Yes. But now you, you weren't always here. You, mm -hmm. you were born in? In the DRC. In, in the DRC. Kinshasa. Shout out to Kinshasa. Shout out to Kinshasa. Just, motherland. Uh, motherland. Oh, not my, it's not my. No, it's, it can't be your brother. No, because. And so... <laughs> So you were so you were born in the DRC. Tell us a, so how let's talk about the making of Ariel Katumbela, mm. right? So you were born in the DRC. Tell us a little bit about that and mm. your journey here to South Africa and what that looked like. Alrighty. So um, if you know anything about the DRC, there's always like it's very rich in um, natural resources. Um, one of the the most wealthy countries when it comes to natural resources. Um, that invites all kinds of trouble. Um, so there's always been either like other countries trying to attack and fight for territory or internal civil wars and stuff like that. So just, there's barely ever peace in the DRC, um, at least from what I know, because I haven't been back. Um, so that's, that could be presumptuous. Um, however, during this time, this was around um, 91, um, you don't want to know about the making, making, but I was conceived. <laughs> it's not that kind of, it's not kind of, kind of podcast. However, uh, so I was conceived. <laughs> and at that time, my dad had already decided when my mom was still pregnant with me to come to South Africa to seek out better opportunities. Um, so... He kind of left, went ahead of us, um, started working. What he tells me, this, I recently found this out like two months ago, is that he slept on the streets for a while, mm. um, trying to build a life here. So he'd like stay at a homeless shelter and trying to find job and like jobs and <laughs> you know, do, I never knew this about my dad. So he did hustle quite a bit, um, managed to land himself a job. He was, um, he studied interior design um, but coming to South Africa during apartheid, you can't really get a job as a black man in interior design. It's not a thing. Um, so he started doing carpentry, and he kind of worked with his hands. Um, now he's doing good. He stays in Zambia. He's kind of working the two. So he, it seems he's, he's using his skills or what he studied for. So that's cool. But um, he started doing that. And in the meantime, my mom's with myself and my sister, who's about um, 16 months older than me. I think it's 16. Yeah, 16. Um, so she has these two kids, like the one is a baby, the other is in her belly, and <laughs> she gives birth to me without my dad. Um, so we lived there for about a year um, in the DRC, and then things started getting quite hectic. So at this point, my mom says, um, the story she tells me is that she would sleep with us, like me strapped on her back, and like ready to go, you know, mm. if need be. Always? Um, like every time she went to Constantly. Bed? I think wow. as it got worse, um, as the tensions got worse, um, she would be more alert. So there was a bag ready to go. And my sister was there and I was, you know, like close enough to just strap, you know, like. Do you remember any of this? Oh, no, 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 no. I young. don't. Okay. I don't. So one day it did happen that she had to put, you know, like up and go and run. Mm. Um, so we ran and we went to a place where um, they transported us to the airport where they would um, kind of take the refugees into South Africa because there was an open road into South Africa and right. so on. So anyway, she straps me on. Um, we begin on our journey here, we arrive. Um, what she told me is that I met my dad and I, for about a year, I told him he was not my dad, like he was wow. Audrey's dad, wow. so my sister Audrey. So I'd be like, Audrey's father, Audrey's father. <laughs> so um, again, that's another, you know, it's, it's more, yeah. Because you hadn't seen see your dad. dad. I, I really. met him when I arrived, yeah. In South Africa? In South Africa, wow. yeah. First time. So I met my dad for the first time sure. when I arrived. 
Um, yeah, so that would, was him and I did have a strained relationship. Like he was happy to see my sister again. You know, this was his first daughter. He had carried her. He had, you know, he remembers so much about being a dad for the first time. You know, he's shared that information with her. Just like, mm. you know, he he sat there, just like, you know, I brought a life into this world. Like, what do I do with it? So he had the full on dad moment and experiences, but not quite that with me. I was just a kid who kind of appeared. You know, I was talking and I had a mind of my own and whatever. So, so him and I's relationship dynamic from there was kind of um, different. Okay. So then you've come now mm. to South Africa uh, with your mom, with your sister. Mm -hmm. Is your, mom, your mom's pregnant at this time? No, no. No, no. so your mom was pregnant with you with before. With me before him. coming. Now she's got you on her back. Yes. And your sister's kind of walking. I'm about one and walking. a half now. Wow, yes, okay. So you're here in South Africa. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about that <clears throat> journey. So we came into South Africa and initially, I think as all people do, like we ended up in a very Congolese community. So it was just Congo in South Africa, like this was Kinshasa, like not really, but you know, it's more Swahili speaking, Kinshasa is Lingala speaking. Anywho, um, so we're in this community, we went to a church this, that was quite different. <laughs> mm. It was a different church from what I'm used to. Faith was very different from what I'm used to now. Because Christianity um, isn't new to you in South Africa, it's part of the Congolese culture actually. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So that's, that's almost like a safe space yeah. coming into South Africa, that's something of the familiar. Yeah. That faith within your culture, you find this place that you can relate to yeah, as a family. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I, what's funny is that one of my earliest memories is arriving in the country. Like I don't know how young I was, but I saw a photo of me, quite little, like probably one or two, um, at a graveyard with the um, tombstone of the person who had um, evangelized into my village. When wow. Yeah. So okay. he, it was like a great, great grandfather of somebody whose church we were going into and wow. whatever. So the person who had brought the, the Christian faith to your village, you're standing buried, next to yeah, the, tombstone the tombstone of that person yeah. in South Africa now. Yes, yeah, wow. yeah. Um, so a lot of, and then my dad's, my dad's dad was a pastor and so on, you know, like sure. so forth. But through, throughout the generation, that person had been the person who sure. um, evangelized into our village. So, so ministry I runs in your family. That. It in does, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not, I'm not sure who exactly it is, but there's somebody in my family who were the first to translate the Bible into Swahili. Wow. So it's from my dad's side. So there is, there's a lot of like ministry heritage in my family. Right. Um, and then kind of ended like with my dad. And then I, I'm here. <laughs> so it's obviously carrying on now. So, so you come into <coughs> South Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, your growing up journey in South Africa is quite hard, actually. Oh, yeah. 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 Tell us something of, as you can kind of go through that, growing up into a young woman, mm. the difficulties of that, there's a breakdown mm. in the marriage, these mm. kinds of things. Tell us, give us some insights into that. And there's quite, there's some really low points in that story as well, yeah. some difficult spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so coming in, like, one thing, I didn't know I was poor. Like, I didn't know I was poor until I compared it to other lives. So initially, like, um, I had a great life. Like, I had mm. my two parents. Um, we lived in a tiny little room, like, at the church. I remember, I remember that. Um, but it was so cute. Like, we had a curtain separating it. For me, that was life. That was home, you know? Like, I didn't have any other context of what a home should look like. Um, so my sister and I were super close. My, brothers got, my brother got born, and um, our family were kind of staying there. And so we moved into a bigger place, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> there's rooms. There's there. two rooms. <laughs> rooms <laughs> plural. Literally. It was, you know the older flats have, like, bigger, like, are more spacious than yes. what you get today. So yes, it was one yeah. of those where it was, like, a balcony. So many memories done, like, happened there. Um, but so we didn't grow, grow up with much. Um, we did grow up in a difficult church situation, um, like friendship wise. And um, yeah, there was just a lot that I feel like I'm still quite scarred by today, mm. um, um, particularly with relinquishing control, um, because I did feel like our friendship circles gave, gave into um, manipulation and um, kind of controlling the older kids, controlling the younger kids and making them these pawns in their game, you know, mm. so. Um, again, all kids and all of that, but you, you know, you get scarred nonetheless. Um, so I think for me, growing up was just, I got, did I tell you I got married? Like when I was little? Yes. It was like this false like wedding. kid marriage yeah, thing. Yeah, man. And like, <laughs> they asked, so I had to steal sheets from my, from my home for the, you know, those lace, 
no sheets and like lace curtains. You know, yes. you, you get those lining. So I had to do that for my wedding dress. Um, some other kids had to steal like food and <laughs> whatever. So we put it together. So I'm done wedding, wedding planning before. <laughs> we put together this wedding. I got married, right? How old are you when you're getting married? I don't even remember. I think I was like six. Sure. Six or seven. There you go. Eh? It was a full on. Just in the game. Just get it was in a there. thing, man. Powerful. Yeah, I don't know. It's my husband. Was the pastor's Hi, son. Hi, if you're watching this, I, is, is your wife. I, I mean... So. <laughs> we should probably like, sign for divorce. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so you had this full-on wedding ceremony. So I had a full-on wedding ceremony. Mm. This is before I, I like arrived at school. Um, I was... You know what was funny about my situation? Is that I was... I was the pretty girl because I had really long hair. So okay. like from birth, my mom used to like um, relax our hair. You know about mm, relaxing mm, now. So mm. it's a chemical process that you do to um, to black hair, yes. basically, because yes. we have kinky hair. Yes. All this fabulousness you see over here. Now, now I want to pause it because yes. you've got a lot to say about this. I do have We've a lot, had a lot to say of conversations about, about this. You've learned and a lot, may, I have actually grown. There may, there may actually be a whole other podcast happening here. Maybe about we hair, get you in another day. Should, um, around skin bleaching, hair straightening, uh, the way that black people, because of social pressures, mm. are, are almost subconsciously forced to conform to something that isn't themselves. Yeah. yeah. And, how, and how your entire environment is reinforcing that the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, so quickly, a, li a little bit. For uh, days. And I'm even cautious to go here because this is another. Because it's going to go. <laughs> but, but you, I mean, you, this is so close to your heart. Yeah. Yeah. And as you think back on that little girl, mm. straightening her hair. Uh, bleaching your skin. Mm. This is just like a thing. Mm. You're sitting in front of that little girl right now. Yeah. What are you going to say to her? What are sure. you going to tell her? What are you going to remind her? So on two levels. On a purely physical level, I would tell younger me, one, you are quite good looking. You're stunning. <laughs> I was a cute child. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> no, kidding. But um, there is that. And then um, let's say you are, you know, let's say you are the most good looking person, whatever. Um, that doesn't count for much in the long term. So work less on that and work more on focusing on who you are as a person. Um, so definitely, I think I, I shied away from many situations growing up because I was so self-conscious about my appearance. Um, so I wouldn't, like I didn't learn to swim because I didn't want to wear a swimsuit. Mm. Um, also, there were not, no pools in ghetto schools, but <laughs> but I, it's not like I didn't have opportunities. Um, like I always thought, oh, no, I wouldn't fit in a swimsuit, like um, so I wouldn't do it. Um, as well as just you know the the way I approached people, the opportunities I you know could have had with friendships and relationships, I always kind of shied away and hid myself until I'm given the go ahead, the approval. Like, hey, you have the stamp of approval, be a person. Um, so I waited for permission to be human. <laughs> so I just sat around waiting for permission. So definitely on an appearance angle, it's like no matter what you look like, it doesn't count for much. The most beautiful people struggle in life. Um, and then also beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Like it just is. Um, I think once you become loved, and I'll touch on that just now, just like when, when you are loved by somebody, they see beyond your, what you look like. Like, I don't know if you've had that. Like, you see people who are just stunning. You're like, wow. And then you get to know people and like, oh, you have really nice eyes. I love the wrinkles between your eyes when you smile or, you know, like stuff like that. Um, so it's just, it was shallow. I think what, by the time I was a teenager and I was like getting into relationships because somebody liked the way I looked like, um, once I achieved the relationship, I was ready for the next thing because I needed somebody else to affirm that. Wow. Um, so I never quite stuck around. I wasn't good at sticking around um, because I've gained the approval here and then I was ready for my next um, journey or conquest yeah. <laughs> of approval. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on a life spectrum, I would say like much broader, um, I think it all comes down to love. Like for me, what I'd sit, look into my little eyes and tell myself, um, would be that you can't earn love. Love is not to be earned. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not right to earn love um, because the result of that is not love. Um, it's something else. It's you becoming something that you think somebody else wants. It's manipulation. It's, um, 
yeah, it's you working, it's work, you know. And not that love's not work, because you do, to some extent, give yourself up when you love people. Um, but with that, just loving, your, loving yourself for who you are and realizing that those who will love you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be solicited. Mm. Um, people choose to love you. And we don't yeah. see a lot of that in the world, no. and you didn't see a lot of that in your context. No. No. So where does that idea come from? Obviously, God comes in oh, to yeah. that story. Definitely. Because you, when you look around at your world, when I th- listen to your stories, mm. and I put myself in the life of young Ariel, mm. there's nothing in your immediate vicinity that would suggest that a love like that is possible, that yeah. what you're experiencing one-on-one. Yeah. Yeah. And yet somehow you come to that conclusion. So what mm. role did God have to play in that? Mm. Um, I wouldn't say completely impossible. My mom was amazing. Like, mm-hmm. she really was a pillar for us. And um, she allowed me to be me till this day. You know, like, she loved me unconditionally. Um, however, well, as far as humanly possible, I'd yeah. say. Um, however, with God, I think I was always transactional about my relationship with him. Like, okay, I do the things and then he comes and, you know, does what he does as God. Um, so I never allowed myself to fully be loved by God. Um, yet he kept going into those places, digging deeper, pulling stuff out, um, and just showing me that he chose me before I could even put up any front. Mm. Um, and, you know, right now I feel like I am in a season um, where I... A space, a space for other people who don't understand agricultural terms. But they do, though, because yeah. it's, it's broad. Like a place, an arc. A oh, we were talking about this. Yes, anime. Arc. Anime arc. arc. Anime is not cartoons. Anime is yeah. illustrated drama. Yes. It's powerful. It's powerful. I, Indeed, I was reprimanded people, last night because people, people are called anime discuss cartoons. discuss it in great depth. Not a thing. But it's an arc. <laughs> it's an arc. It's a C, okay? So <laughs> you're in a current arc. Okay. I'm in an arc. Um, so my current arc um, comes out of a place of I think I went through an affirmation phase where I found depth and relationship with God because I had felt affirmed. Like, I feel like God wasn't checking a lot of my dysfunction, Um, but he just took me in. And not checking as in, well, this is, you know, like, I need you to be this in order to to call you mine. Um, It was more him just allowing certain things because he knew I needed to walk the, the the, can I say journey? Mm, yeah, I think the we journey. all go through <laughs> and Road. seasons. And we all seasons. Go seasons. We all have autumn, winter, spring. Uh, <laughs> That's true. I correct myself. But so, arc is cool. Anyway. <laughs> I like arc. Anyway, yeah. um, so I was just on this journey, like currently, well, I am on this journey, let's say, um, of just dismantling stuff, like stuff that I feel God is saying, okay, now this is what we have to deal with. Mm. All of that has surfaced. Wow. Um, so I feel like kind of cruddy. This is PG, can I say? Cruddy, cruddy. Yeah, bad. I feel like crud. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot that's been hidden under the surface okay. um, that I hadn't realized. Um, but I think in the phase that I am in my life right now, God is showing me um, that it's, like, I think the mushy stuff is done. Like, the, oh, cute, kindly, like, I'm accepted, I'm loved, you know, I'm valued. All of that still remains. I'm not saying, like, that, that's a a different arc. All of that remains. But from that lens, God is showing me um, the things in my life that need adjusting and attention um, in terms of sin, um, mindset, pride. Um, yeah, just the hard stuff to mm. deal with. And you're finding that even though he's seeing this all in you, mm. he's loving you there. And that's a place of strength. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see it more because I do think I am like, and that's why I'm saying it's it's consistent because I know who he is. Um, I don't feel like I'm loved because of it, but God has remained consistent. Right. So he doesn't depend on me to understand what he's doing and to formulate this idea of, oh, well, now I think God is thinking this way and there's a lens of love and a filter of love. Um, sometimes I don't feel like that. Sometimes I tend to want to just draw away from God, but um, just knowing that he's consistent. And I don't think my relationship with God would be a thing if he hadn't pursued me. Mm. I know that he's the active one and I'm the responsive one. Right. Um, so even in the hard stuff, you know, where I'm just like, yeah, I've, I feel like I've given up. Like, I feel like I'm unloved. Um, my feeling doesn't define the direction I head. Um, it's always, you mm. know, God being the good shepherd. Um, yes. You know, the whole analogy of, you know, just 
slightly, making sure he leads me on the path of righteousness, you know. So um, I've felt his, the rod, <laughs> but it's been tender. Mm. Like, it's been definitely loving. Um, so this idea that faith is not feelings, mm. right, and mm. that... Uh, and that it's God's character, even in spite of our experience of that character yeah. sometimes, that yeah. can carry us through. Yeah. What we know about God beyond the moment. Mm. Is, yeah. Would that be true? I'm Absolutely. trying to, does that help you? Yeah, that he gives us revelation about him. I think that's why it's never helpful in our faith to be like, let me find out more information about the things, like what direction I need to head, what I need to do. If that doesn't come with the foundation of the knowing of God, all of that's built on um, something right. broken right. because that becomes your pillar and that becomes your strength. Um, so if that is shifted and that's broken, you begin to wonder like, okay, now where is God in this? Um, I've always known to relate to God as somebody who's somewhat has it, uh, someone who has it together. Um, but if that pillar is broken and I don't know his character and I don't know his nature, my whole faith falls apart. Mm. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that um, my focus right now is not necessarily on how I fix the things that are broken, but on how I dig deeper into knowing him. Mm -hmm. And in that, he's the one who brings transformation. Mm -hmm. um, the answer is always him. Like, regardless of, it sounds like, you know, like typical um, Sunday school answers, where it's, the answer is Jesus. It really is. Like, I'm starting to come to a place where I realize that. Um, and not because it's just like a quick escape to something, because if not, my whole faith would fall apart at this place in my right. life. Um, because I realize how, just how far I fall short from his glory and his love and his grace. And your um, lack of, there's this cool thing, uh, a phrase that says, you're not equipped to tinker with your own soul. Mm, like you actually don't have the capacity brilliant. with yeah. that. You yeah, know? it's not a thing. And yeah. I think that's why scripture calls Jesus the great physician. Mm. It's like if you, if you have heart issues, you're not going to go around just starting to yeah. Because you know that although you can diagnose the pain, yeah. you can't heal the problem. Absolutely. Right? You're going to go to a physician. You're going to go to a surgeon. Mm. And I think in the same way, some of our deepest pains, mm. we can diagnose the pain, but we can't solve the problem. Yeah. We're not yeah. equipped to tinker with our own yeah. souls. Yeah. Just, we just see symptoms, right. basically. Right. Yeah. Um, so Very absolutely. Good, sure. So I do feel like um, right now God is, and you know, like I was saying, I was discussing this earlier, but how God has like exposed all of this stuff and showed me this stuff. Um, but I always related to him based on how I thought he saw me. Um, so whatever facades I had put out up or like everything. So that's how I related to God. That Therefore I could like boldly be around him and just like, oh, he loves me and all of that. As soon as the mess comes out, um, my tendency was just to draw back, like hide away, don't be vulnerable. Don't um, make sure he doesn't see what he's already seen, you know, in a sense. Um, so what God has been reassuring me of um, and kind of revealing his character and his nature is I've known this before you knew I knew this. Mm. Um, so every way I've ever related with you, way before you even thought you were a sinner or, you, you know, you're super innocent, I knew these things, um, yet I called you out um, and I picked you. Yes. Like I've, I made a conscious decision yes. to step in the way, yes. you know, and yeah, and... and Love you. <laughs> so good. <Yeah. laughs> but um, just to accept that posture, like, we'll take the posture of um, God doesn't ask us for permission. Once we've submitted our desire and our will to his ways, yes. he does what he does. I think, I think it's a lordship issue. Yeah. I think in uh, contemporary Christianity, we don't like the idea of lordship. Mm. We like the idea of friendship. Yes. We, are, we like the idea of worship. Yeah. Uh, what affection. is worship, yeah, yeah. But yeah. this idea of like affection. And, yeah. But we don't like the idea of of lordship, mm. that Jesus is actually a king. This yes. is not a democracy. Yeah. He's not taking votes. Yeah. He has a way that he wants to run the world. Yeah. And we actually struggle to submit to that that's very true. often. Yeah, that's right. true. Yeah. But, it, but, it's, but actually, um, being under his lordship is much better mm. than being the victim of our freedom. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Our freedom isn't actually freedom. Yeah. It's, Think about all the freedoms exactly. we've had. Exactly. Like, this is messed stuff up. Yeah. Uh, final thought as we mm. close up. You, you look forward at the world today. So we, mm. we look out into our society. Yeah. We have this idea of following Jesus. Yeah. And you have to share something with people watching this, people mm. thinking about what does, uh, in your particular context, so don't mm. try and, let's not try and go global. I don't think yeah. any of us can address necessarily a global context. Mm. But in your context, 
what would you say to the church? What would you say to people trying to follow Jesus? What do they need to be really thinking about mm. if we want to follow Jesus authentically today? Sure. Oh, I think the unchanging nature of Jesus. Right. Um, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, Jesus didn't become millennial during the millennial phase. He didn't become um, modern <laughs> during the world. He doesn't adjust to us. Mm. Um, we adjust, and he relates to us. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes we try and like construct this idea of who we think Jesus is, like what we think we can, how we think we can act towards him. Like, oh no, like his holiness is somehow you know like watered down and dwindled yeah. down. So I think there's a big sense of familiarity, and you know you touched on the lordship thing, um, where we have an unhealthy familiarity with Jesus, where right. it's um, there isn't. Like relationship comes with reverence. Like when you love someone, um, you can, unless it's dysfunctional, you, you, you know, like you have a respect for mm. them. You have a, a desire to know them for who they are. You have a right. desire to um, allow them to be who they are. Um, so I'd say familiarity is one of the things the church today really has to look out for. Yeah, like um, reinstating Jesus as king. Yes. Yes. In our hearts. Yeah. And then the obedience that necessarily flows from Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And that's a really hard it's a really hard thing to do in a culture that's so profoundly humanistic. Oh yeah. It's like yeah. we will accept God as long as that God looks like us. Absolutely. It's yeah. very hard for yeah. us to accept a Jesus that demands obedience, devotion. Yeah. yeah. And yet that's the only Jesus that really brings life. Yeah, especially in this like age of, you know, like relative truth and, yeah. and all of that. It's just like it starts at me yeah. and then moves outwards. Yeah. You know, like truth, the, the source of truth is self. Yeah. Um, yet when we shift that and say, okay, regardless of what is happening around me, let me make the starting point of truth, Jesus. Very good. How will life look like sure, um, when yeah, we yeah. make um, decisions based on that? Yeah. Um, and not, not like costing aside your experiences and your relative truth, but always putting it against, you know, like parallel to what Jesus has to say. What is the truth and what is my truth? And allowing him to do the good work of kind of working that out and making that so um, conform to his ideas. And, and how the truth is a person. Absolutely. Because Jesus is I am alive. the way, the truth, and the life. So good. Yeah. Ariel, yes. thank you for being on Follower. Thank you. Uh, I made it, Mama. <laughs> yeah, I was there. Guys, if you've enjoyed this, uh, subscribe, subscribe, share, share, share. I really do believe in this work. Mm. I think stories like Ariel's are gonna help people. Yeah. And so if you think that this is gonna be helpful for people, share it on every platform yes, that you can it. with everyone you know, do so it. that as many people can get involved in the conversation. Uh, thank you for your time. We'll see you in the next episode of The Making Of.